That was beautiful. I don't know why they didn't ask me <laughs> to do a trio. I don't understand it. Uh, Dave talked about Dave talked about uh, that book table. I'd like to recommend one book that I think is one of the most significant books uh, going. Um, we use it at our school in systematic theology, and that is the book by Dave Dunlop, Limiting Omnipotence. I would get this. I would read it. It's not a difficult read, but it is an important read. Would you do that? I don't know how much they are, but they're good. It's right on there, but my, I had to get my glasses. Um, getting old. Dave, how old are you, bro? That's about right. <laughs> When's your birthday? First of July. He's older. He's older than me. I'm such a kid. <laughs> such a child. Well, I got saved. I, got, I, got, I was born July 6th, 1952. And uh, so we're the crew of 52. Uh, amen, bro. Amen. We got to stick together. <laughs> Um, and then I, at the age of 18, I trusted Christ as my personal Savior, March 22nd, 1971. And a guy that led me to Christ, his name was Dave Weibel. Can you believe that? Cool name, Dave Weibel. And we always said to him, you know, you ought to have your own edition of the Bible, Weibel's Bible. I thought that was pretty good. And, <laughs> and so Dave led me to Christ. And uh, it was the best day of my life. Best day of my life. Absolutely no questions about it. Second best, marrying Barb. And third best, having a son. That's, we only have one kid. He's married now. I can't believe I'm getting so old, Dave. What's the deal? Okay, so uh, Dave, after a few years, you know, we had good fellowship, sweet fellowship, etc. cetera. Uh, Dave got involved with a group. It was an interesting group. Um, I had led, like last night I said, I had read a few books by a guy named Watchman Nee. And uh, I had read, at Dave's behest, uh, watch, uh, reading a guy by the name of Witness Lee. Witness Lee is a guy uh, who was a co-worker in China with Watchman Nee. Uh, Watchman Nee was uh, imprisoned by the, at the chi uh, communist purge in China and imprisoned in and out, in and out, and uh, was a, a marked preacher, good preacher, teacher, that kind of thing. Witness Lee was a co-worker working with him. Another guy named Stephen Kong uh, worked with them as well. Well, at the communist purge, Witness Lee went over to Taiwan and Watchman Nee died in prison. And um, Watchman, or Witness Lee came to the United States right here in California. First of all, in Maryland, where Stephen Kong and him were together, and then Stephen, Stephen Kong stayed in Maryland, and, and Witness Lee came to here, came to Anaheim, actually, and uh, <clears throat> started a group called the Local Church. Uh, you'd have to ask yourself, you'd say, what, what are you telling us this for? What, what, what gives? Uh, so the w local church, so they were so influential. Uh, my friend Dave, uh, they started to uh, have a group in Akron, Ohio. Uh, they felt that they needed to leave Akron and because they made the statement that God was finished with Akron. And uh, then they went to Cleveland and uh, my friend Dave got involved with them in a very heavy way and really wanted me to join that group. Uh, you ever have these times where you're going, something's wrong? Something's not right with this? You know? And so I went to a few meetings, and it was really, really strange. I mean, I was a... Uh, Pentecostal, charismatic, etc. type of person at that time. 
And, uh, but I went to this group, and uh, man, some of their things were really, really different. Um, they said that uh, there was no such thing as doctrine. There was no such thing as church leadership. Um, and as you examined them uh, further, as you, as you took a, a good look at something, uh, look at them uh, and what they wrote, what Witness Lee wrote, uh, they, they found out, you found out that there was no such thing as doctrine. Uh, you turn the page, uh, but you have to have your good, you have to have good doctrine. Uh, there's no such thing as the church, but the church is this. And uh, it was really, really a strange thing. Uh, coming to find out that they believed in Sabellianism. Sabellianism, you say, what? Sabellianism, you know, I took uh, I put chamomile on that once, you know, I, or I, 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 you know, I got, it's like, you know, I put Benadryl on that. Uh, Sabellianism is a doctrine that was taught in the third century by a guy named Sibelius. And he taught this. He taught that the, the Trinity is like this. It's like he would say, uh, Sibelius would say that there is one person in the Godhead. Not three distinct persons. So you mentioned that last night about the three distinct within one nature. Sibelius taught that Jesus was the Father, that Jesus was the Holy Spirit. One person, three modes or aspects of being, three ways that presented themselves. And an illustration that Sibelius would have used would be something like this. Uh, my wife, my, my, my dear wife, okay, she is a mom, she is a daughter, and she is a wife. That, to me, she's a wife. That's one mode of, or aspect of who she is, right? To my son, she's mom, another mode or aspect of being. You got this? You got this? Okay, I, I want to have you follow me. To her parents, she, she was daughter. And that's how you would explain, that's how you would explain Sibelianism. Uh, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD condemned it along with Arius, who started Arianism, uh, that said that Jesus was a created being, right? So they condemned both Sibelius and Arius uh, in that council because it went contrary to the word of God. Orthodox teaching, the normal orthodox teaching of the Word of God. And it is heretical. Okay, so if, if you have Jesus being to, you know, in one aspect being the Father and then another aspect being the Holy Spirit, etc., then you have no propitiation. You have no atonement. For whom, to whom did Jesus atone our sins? And when you have on the, in the Word of God, when you look at the Word of God, when the Lord Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, is He praying to Himself? You would have to say He would be praying to Himself. And so these, these, these are the issues, okay? So I, I didn't find this stuff out. I, I had a real problem because they were coming in and they wanted me to be a part of that group. Very legalistic. They did not want me to marry Barb. And uh, this is interesting because in Colossians it says forbidding to marry. And I thought to myself, this is, this is just unbelievable. Their modus operandi or the way they worked is that they would come into an assembly like this and they would talk the same talk you talk, but they had different meanings to what their... Their, uh, they had different meanings to their def different definitions. That's what they would do. With the idea of splitting the assembly and taking people away. That was their goal. Okay? You got a picture of this? So these guys are not on the up and up. These guys were not on the up and up. And when I... Uh, it was really, really interesting. Um, I went to a Christian bookstore, Zondervan Christian Bookstore, in Euclid, Ohio. And I was walking 
I was walking through, and uh, I had already done a cult seminar against Wit Witness Lee in the local church. We did it against the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and I took the section on the local church, Witness Lee in the local church, just quoting their books. That's all I did. Because they would sue you. They would sue you if they felt there was defamation of character. They would. They had deep pockets. That was, they were rich. And they would take you to court. And uh, you had to defend yourself in terms of the heretical. They would say, you've slandered us, etc. They would do this kind of thing. So when I did the cult seminar, I just gave exactly what they said. And uh, it was really, really interesting because at the cult seminar, we had seven guys from the local church sitting right there. Seven guys sitting right there. And one guy, and when we finished, when I finished, a guy goes, I want to respond to that. He said, have your own cult seminar. <laughs> we wouldn't let him talk. We wouldn't let him talk. It was, you know, it was just over. I said, you know, we're not, we're not taking any questions from you in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I had a friend... Uh, he was a friend, I mean, he was a good brother in Christ, and then he got caught, caught with Dave in this group, right? So I'm in this Zondervan Christian bookstore, and I'm walking through there, and I'm looking at all these books, you know, Christian bookstore, right? And I see a whole rack of Witness Lee books, and that's pure heresy. And I'm going, I'm like so grieved, it's unbelievable. So I went to the manager of the Christian, Zondervan Christian bookstore and I said, look it, uh, this is, uh, this is, do you realize what these people are doing? Do you realize their doctrinal positions? Do you realize what this is? Because if you don't have Jesus as God in the flesh and separate from the Father in terms of personality, but united in terms of unity, not only unity, but one in essence with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, the Holy Spirit is not an act of force. It is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person, three distinct persons within one nature. That's the orthodox teaching of the scriptures. And if you variate from that, as Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. This has salvation ramifications. This is just not your thoughts versus my thoughts. People will go to hell because they don't have the right Jesus. That's true. I mean, you look at the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses. He's, he's Michael the Archangel. If you look at Jesus of the Mormons, he is the spirit brother of Lucifer. So you have real problems. You've got different Jesuses. And that's exactly what Paul writes to the Corinthians. He says, But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his craftiness, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh and preacheth another Jesus, or bringeth another spirit, you might well bear with him. So we, are been, we have been warned in the scriptures, and we're going to talk a little further about this. So I go to the manager, and I'm telling him this, you know, and I said, look at you, you, this is really heretical. Oh, no, this is good stuff. This is all right. I said, well, how did you get these books? They had a representative come and said, would you please just sell these books, you know? And uh, we, we did it. Oh, yeah, this is great. <sighs> then a girl who was working with the manager came over to me privately, and she said, one of the guys, his name was Barry, came and said, you're, you're Chris Schroeder, right? And I said, yeah. And she was. Yeah, he said that you are with us and that you are with us and that you're behind what we say. And I said, let me tell you something. That's a flat out lie. So I got uh, together with that guy who said that about me to Barry. And I said, I want you to know, understand something right, right off the bat. I'm rebuking you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you because what you're doing is absolute sinful behavior. It's a lie. And uh, if, you ever, if you do that again, it's, 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 God's coming after you. It is, you're, it's a wicked way of doing things. And I did right to his face. And he was been a friend a long time. And uh, that's exactly what I told him. That's exactly what I told him. So these things, these things are really important. And so... Peter is going to talk to us about this because what happens is 
people come in to an assembly type of a situation. And uh, I was telling uh, one of the brothers here, you know, the assembly is like an emergency room. It really is. It's like an emergency room. And so you have to, you have a spiritual triage taking place uh, in, in with uh, what's taking, you know. So people come in, they love it, and they sit down and they go, oh yeah. And, they, and if they're heretical in their base thinking, they're going to change. They're going to be chameleon in, in their thinking. And that's true. See, we have this idea oftentimes as Christians. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And we think we've got to love everybody and have everybody be happy and all this kind of stuff. And everybody's viewpoint is excellent and all that kind of thing. And the absolute, it's not true. It is not true. You know, when they have the elders here at this assembly, they are sheepdogs. They are sheepdogs. In other words, they are here not only to minister, and to, but they're to protect the flock. And they're watching ever so carefully. The elder group that doesn't do that, watch out for that assembly because that assembly is just going to go... There'll be all manner of stuff coming in that will confuse people like crazy and damage them spiritually. Damage them spiritually. Peter writes to these guys uh, about these guys in chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. He shows us three marks of a false teacher with which we must be discerning. You must be discerning in order to be safe spiritually. You must be discerning in order to be safe spiritually. Uh, we would look at, uh, you know, I was talking to a fella, you know, um, recently, and he was telling me about a situation with his family in which one of the family members was very ill. Uh, what I, I told you about Lake Larry last night, Larry Mellinger, the best chiropractor. You know, one of the things that I really appreciate about Larry is he's really discerning. He can, and you're like that too, Steve, you know, in terms of, Steve is an emergency room doctor, so let me just tell you a little bit about Steve. Steve is an emergency room doctor, and so what he does is a guy comes in, I shadowed him one day, that was fun too, and I did at the hospital and in the emergency room, and he's got to make a quick assessment. He's got to look at all the signs of what's taking place, what's wrong with you, how is this going? And he's not going to, you know, the face value, he's not going to do that. He's going to say, I'm going to order some tests or I'm going to do some physical tests like that guy with the appendicitis, you know, that type of thing here and here is tender, ha, ah, ah, ha, ah, ha, you know, that kind of thing. And well, it's probably an appendicitis. He ordered a, a surgeon to come in and, and remove it, etc. So he's got to do the triage right off the bat. He's got to be discerning about what takes place. That means a couple of things. It means he had to study to know what those signs were. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is why we started TEPSI, the Ezekiel Project School of Evangelism. Uh, you know, and if you want any further information, we can talk. It's, a, it's, the, you know, it's college level, actually post-grad level in some cases, and it is free, tuition free, because we believe we shouldn't charge for that. So, we want to teach you in Tepsi how to discern. But you've got to know the real thing first and compare the false to the real thing. If you know the real thing really well, you'll get it down. You'll get it down cold. You really will. You'll know exactly because it's different than the real thing. And you'll say something's up and then you do further investigation. That is so important. Now, okay, 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 okay. I know it's in the morning. It's Saturday morning and you haven't had your coffee yet or you did have your coffee yet and it hasn't kicked in yet <laughs> or whatever, okay. Don't minimize what this is saying. Your spiritual life is on the line. When Dave wanted me to get in there, flags were going off, but I had no right understanding of it. 
And there's only one guy that I knew that could give me those you know, understanding of it, and that was Walter Martin. So I called down from Ohio to Cupertino, and I, got, I talked, to, talked to him, and he got me to Bob and Gretchen Passantino. They're both with the Lord now. And uh, Bob and Gretchen shared with me, and I taped it about the local church, and they shared with me about the doctrine of the Trinity, about the doctrine of the church, about all these different... And it was like, oh man, it makes sense why they're doing what they're doing and what the differences are. Flags were going off, but I had no knowledge. And I studied like crazy. I studied like crazy to understand why this was so bad. And it was so very bad. And as the more I studied, the more appalled I became with that. So Peter is writing and he says in chapter 2, uh, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as they were, shall be false teachers among you who secretly shall bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon them swift destruction. You know, when you look at this, I mean, I got an outline and everything, but we're going to just... Uh, we're going to move a little bit from this outline. We're going to move. I'd like you to keep your finger here. Notice what he said. They will secretly come in among you. That means you're not going to know. You're not going to know. They're not going to come in and go, hey, heretic here, what's up? You know, hey, wrong theology that will destroy people spiritually forever and ever. Hey, how's it going? They're not going to do that. They come in. They sound like you. They smell like you but they don't believe like you. They don't do it. And so you have to be very, very wary of this. And I want you to turn to Acts chapter 20, if you would. Acts chapter 20. And I want you to look with me at, at what Paul says to the saints, the church at Ephesus. Acts, and he's, he's speaking to them in the... You know, he, you know, he's just so, he was there for three years. John was there until he died. So you have two of the biggest apostles, uh, you know, some of the two of the greatest apostles speaking and being at that assembly. And if you look at Revelation chapter 2 and 3, one of the churches of the church at Ephesus, there is no testimony there today because they lost their first love. But they were an assembly that really knew what they were doing because, and notice verse 17, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And then he got together with them and he's telling them, verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers. So he's talking to the elders of the assembly. And he's saying, the church at Ephesus, and he's saying, you know, Take heed. Take heed. In other words, sit up. In Kansas terms, it's a Kansas prairie dog, man, that pops his head out of the ground with his ears going, thruh, 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 watching ever so carefully of what's taking place. You see this in deer as well. You know, you see a deer, you just make a little noise. We have deer coming in our backyard. We go like this outside. And, <laughs> and their ears are like radar thing. And then if they feel it's a boom, gone, you know, they're just gone. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Notice verse 29. For this, for no, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves Enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that for the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. Okay, so he's telling them, watch out. Be very careful. Take heed on this. Don't, don't allow somebody to come in and do this. And, and um, when we go back to 2 Peter chapter 2, 
he t- that's exactly what he says. Beware of this. Know that false prophets, will, well, they will come in. They're among the people, even as the false teachers among you, who secretly shall bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring them to themselves swift destruction. God takes a very dim view. Uh, Okay, let me just say this. God takes a very dim view of those of you who are coming into this assembly or any other assembly to destroy it. He does. And those elders have a responsibility, you know. We want to be, I'm an elder in my assembly, and Steve is an elder in his, and we want, and and Dave, and, and Dave Jr., and and uh, Mark Stratton, and I'm not sure how many other, uh, the other guy, he, they just mentioned, okay, uh, so, so Ron, 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 Rod Chance, yes, hi, hi, hi brother, it's my last time here, isn't it, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, so, I mean, you know, they're, they're watching like sheepdogs, man, they are, and they well should, we started our, we helped start our assembly, Calvary Bible Chapel, Right off the bat, we had people coming in to try to destroy us. We had to be very wary of what was taking place. They, I mean, you know, brand new assembly. We were meeting, and one of the things that we did, I think, that was a wise move, was we planted our flag theologically. We said, here's where we are. And we wrote a doctrinal statement that, that went into our 501c3 tax-exempt paperwork along, you know, with our constitution. But we said, here's what it is, and we give that out. Here is where we stand. That saved us. That saved us because when guys came in, we said, here's, here's where we are. You can't do this. You can't save this. So listen, bro, you know, when you're, when you're a pilot, chopper pilot, right? Right? You have to look at all the engine systems. You have to look at the rotary. You have to look at the tail rotors. You have to look at the pitch and the yaw. You have to, look at, you have to make sure all these wires are connected, don't you? This is exactly what the elders have to do and what you should be doing as well as a Christian, a part of an assembly of believers. This is what you should be doing. So you know what that means? You know, you know what that means? It means work. It means you have to study to show yourself. That means you have to do it. There is not one excuse for us to be ignorant biblically and doctrinally. Not one excuse. You got them on your phones. You can can get Logos. You get 800 volumes on your phone. You can get Blue Letter Bible. You can get uh, Olive Tree. And you can get all these things. We we buy, you know, uh, we buy a lot of junk, right? Why as well invest it into some of these books that would teach us and help us and minister to us and give us wisdom? There is not one excuse for you. Not one excuse. And it, you might even think, well, I'm retired. You know, you look at these retired sisters, you know, and uh, they're, they're, uh, I mean, she speaks three languages. Three languages, okay? But there's no excuse for you not to know this stuff. There isn't. Now, I don't care if you're a geezer, aspiring geezer, or, you know, past geezerhood. It doesn't matter. You are responsible before God for this information. You are. Sorry. You don't retire from the will of God. And you don't retire from the Word of God. You don't do it. You need to have it. You need to have it down. And so he's telling us, these guys will come in. And it, they will come in to destroy. 2 Corinthians chapter, write this one down, will you? 2 Cor chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writes, and he says this in verse 3, but I fear, and we've already quoted this, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his craftiness. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh and preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, whom you have not received, or another gospel, which we have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And then go down to verse 13. For such 
are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. That is exactly what Peter is saying as well. These guys will be destroyed. They are empty wind. You know, they have nothing. And they live a licentious life. And they want to put you into bondage with their heresy. They want to do this. Paul writes again to Timothy. Look at Timothy chapter 3, if you don't mind. Turn to uh, first, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Know this also, then, in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covered to boast or proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, etc., without natural affection. You know, the church is facing today, the church is facing such heretical doctrine with the guise of tolerance. With the guise of tolerance. You cannot speak what the Bible says about homosexuality for fear of being sued as a hate crime. You can't do it. The Bible condemns that. It doesn't, you know, re receive it. We love the sinner for, without a shadow of a doubt. No questions about it. But drunkenness, disobedient to parents, homosexuality, these things are condemned in the Word of God. But yet you've got people who are trying who are trying to make it acceptable in the assembly or acceptable in the church at large. They're trying to do this and saying, it's just a genetic thing. Reminds me of the time I was online in the, in the, the gay lesbian chat room for old CompuServe. And my moniker was as subtle as a freight train. My moniker was preacher. <laughs> you know, and I say, isn't it great to know the forgiveness of God? Man! They guys were telling me to do things with my body that I couldn't do. They were telling me to do this. And so they said, I'd get a little side chat. Preacher, it's genetic. It's totally genetic. I said, preacher. I said, I said this is the preacher. You, what if they find the gene, isolate it, and can change it? Wow, man, they went crazy and started swearing at me like crazy. When I preach the gospel on the streets in New York City especially, I've preached in, in Greenwich Village. And uh, I've had lesbians hu hugging each other right in my meetings. And that's fine. I'm glad they're there. They were just hugging each other. And I'm glad they're there because I wanted to give them the gospel because the gospel is the only thing that can change their lives. And it wasn't the sin of homosexuality that would send them to hell. It's because they're sinners. And so a guy could be a heterosexual and love his family and all that kind of stuff. Without Jesus, he's still going to hell. Jesus Christ is the only answer for the sin question. But we need to understand that there are people that are going to come into our assembly talking a good talk, talking the same type of talk, and they have in their mind your destruction. And if you think that I'm kidding, if you think that I'm kidding about this, and you don't heed this, this is exactly what Peter is saying, they will secretly come in. And if you think that that's not true, and Chris is all wet on that, you have, you're, you're going to learn by experience. And that experience will not be a pleasant one. It will be damaging, a damaging experience that will forever mark your life. It will. It'll forever mark your life, uh, especially right here and now. And then he tells them, he says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, 2 Timothy 3, 7. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men as theirs also was. But you have fully known my doctrine, manner of life, 
purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, and patience. You've known all these things. In chapter 4, man, I mean, what else can he warn us about? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, myths, things that make no sense whatsoever, stories, myths. Did you know that the Mormons say that, that uh, God was really Adam God? And he had, uh, he had carnal knowledge. <laughs> he had carnal knowledge with Mary. He had carnal knowledge with Mary to bring the spirit brother of Lucifer, Jesus, into this world. Did you know that's exactly what they teach? That's what Mitt Romney taught as a missionary for a Mormon church. That's exactly, and he still believes that. His son, or his son, his father, George Romney, former governor of, the, of Michigan, was a missionary in that regard. And that's exactly what they teach, that they're going to get their own little planet. Are you kidding me? If you didn't think that this was so serious, you'd be laughing that somebody made this up. This is some kind of, are you kidding? This is some story. But they're deadly serious about it. They're deadly serious about it. And... <laughs> Peter is too, that these people will come in among you and do this. And um, you need to beware. You need to be very, very aware because they come in and they do this. Question I have for you, okay? Do you recognize this? The mark of heresy of false teachers, do you recognize this? And if you're saying to yourself this morning, I don't know enough, well, end it. No. Know it. No games on this, folks. This is the future life of your children. Get this, get this. Okay, so we're talking about witness in the local church and doctrine of the heresy, right, of the Trinity, right? Got that, right? I'm an elder in another assembly long ago, and I'm walking through. We took a break, and I'm walking through. The, they had this, uh, like, gymnasium with off the side. They had uh, uh, Sunday school rooms, and I, I'm just walking. I'm taking a break, you know, and I'm walking in. I go into one of the Sunday school rooms, and I'm looking, and I'm going, oh, this is really, and I'm an elder of this assembly, and I'm looking at, the, looking at the wall, and one of the teachers did a nice job on the wall. It really is beautiful, you know, preparing for the, teach, you know, the kids. The Trinity is like a mother, daughter, wife. And she's teaching our kids heresy. And didn't even know it. Didn't even know it. It's, that's, that, that's a full-blown, full-blown heresy, like we just we mentioned at the beginning. Modalistic monarchianism by, taught by Sibelius, condemned in the third century by the Council of Nicaea and condemned by the Word of God. And yet they, that lady was teaching that to our precious children. So those kids are now burned in their brain of what the doctrine of the Trinity is, falsely so-called. I, I, I hope you think this is important. I really do. If we, if we miss on this, we miss. We miss huge and I hope you guys aren't leaving because of... <laughs> Not that I would point it out. And notice verse 2 of Second Peter chapter 2. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of shall be evil spoken of. They will get followers. They will get followers. I've seen splits. I've seen splits in assembly over doctrine. 
I really have. I've seen the damage it does. I've seen it. And it's, you, you go, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? We say we hold to the Word of God, and yet we don't hold to the Word of God because we like that person who is teaching that stuff. My allegiance is not to a person except Jesus Christ. My allegiance is not only to him personally, but to the written word of God. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's it. And rightly divided. That's where my allegiance has to be, and that's where your allegiance has to be. Uh, you know, I want you to turn with me, if you would, please, to Jude. It's right before the book of Revelation. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me, verse 3, to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto, this, unto the saints. You know that word contend mean? BDAG puts it this way. BDAG is a Greek lexicon, uh, which is really one of the big standards in terms of the Greek language. You know what it says? Contend? Fight. Fight. Oh, we never fight, Chris. No, we're acceptance of everybody, and this is just wonderful. No, it means to fight. And Paul talks about that too in Acts 17 when he went to the, uh, the, the Mars Hill and he contended with those guys. It means literally he fought with them. He contended with them. He did. And people say, well, that's unspiritual. No, it is commanded earnestly contend for the faith. Notice the adverb gives the strength to the verb. Earnestly contend for the faith. The faith, and the article is there, for the faith that was once delivered. And that's the word of God. We earnestly contend for the faith. We not, no messing around on this. This is what we are commanded to do. We're to do it with meekness and fear, for sure, as, Paul, as Peter writes in the first epistle. But we are to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. And it says, for there are certain men. Look at verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we're to do. We are to do this. We are to look at the mark of heresy, the mark of deception, and the mark of the destruction. It is destruction on these individuals for sure. And then he says, Jude goes on and says in verses 14 through 19, And Enoch also, the seventh of Adam, prophesied of these saying, saying that behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convict all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking about, walking after their own lust with their mouth, speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of the advantage. And he is condemning them. My dear brothers and sisters, we are absolutely commanded to do this. For us not to be wary of this, and I just, I know these, I know, I even know Rod. Can you imagine that? I know Rod Chance. I know you, Dave. We've known each other a long time. I know your son, getting to know him. Like what I see, I really do. And I know Mark Stratton. They're watching out for your soul. They're watching out. They come to the breaking of bread and they're like sheepdogs. They don't come. But they're listening to everything. And they're funneling it through this. They're sifting what you say through this. And if it doesn't square with this, 
you're going to hear from them. Lovingly and gently, but you will hear from them. And this is their task. And I hope you pray for these guys at this assembly. And in your assembly, if you come from afar, pray for those elders. Pray for not only that, but you can also assist them and minister to them and be a blessing to them. And if you're one of those that are here that, you know, and you're bad news bears in terms of heretical, be warned. God's coming after you. God takes a very dim view. Father, we pray right now and ask you that you would help us in this endeavor of being discerners and help us to really, really, really know your word Live your word. Be instructed by your word. And do what you would have us to do. Uh, obedient to your word. Even in the hard things. And we ask this, Lord. Protect this assembly. Protect our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.